Today we talk economics. And to do so, we have the Vice President of the European Commission on the show, Jyrki Katainen. Yeah, baby, and we go deep. We are very committed because uh, according to our understanding, circular economy will be the next mega trend in the world market economy. Vice President Katainen is in charge of jobs, growth, investments and competitiveness at the European Commission. Who better than him could we invite to address those issues in depth in the context of the EU circular economy policy package, of course. Today I wanted to make a mark, a mark to celebrate the European Commission's commitments towards circular economy. So I called a, a tattoo artist and got into a little bit of a multitasking exercise during the interview. You'll understand in a minute. So, if there's anything, just tell me and we take a break, all right? Yeah. And don't forget to breathe and lay still. That's the most important. Don't go and die. <laughs> a few moments later. Good morning, Cabinet Katainen. Hello, good morning. This is Camille Aldebran from the Green Exchange. Yes. I'm just going to put you through to Vice President Katainen now. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. You're listening to the Green Exchange, episode 4 of our series Circular Economy in Practice. Seducing the financial sector. Yes, I thought that getting myself a circular economy tattoo on the shoulder while interviewing Katainen was a good idea, since we were going to talk about commitment. But let me back up for a second, because this is actually a very serious interview. As we touched on earlier, in the transition towards a circular economy, there are some changes that can be made incrementally or by improving existing systems, like increasing recycling rates, for instance, or better designing products so they can enter circular loops. I'm not saying it's easy, but we're talking about improving practices within an existing system. Then you have changes that are more radical, and they need to happen too. Selling products as a service, as we discussed, is a good example. This creates a complete different cash flow structure for the company. Instead of receiving 200 euros right away when you buy your new jacket, the company may receive 5 euros per month from your subscription. And even if everyone agrees that there are long-term economic benefits to circularity of the economy, there are a few roadblocks we need to figure out. This is something I had a chance to discuss earlier with Bas Deleu. He's the managing director of the World Resources Forum. And by the way, we'll be publishing his extensive interview in full as a bonus episode. To give you a taste, here's one key moment which connects to today's episode and, and to what I was talking about earlier. Um, industry, the business sector, is of course very diverse, um, not only big and small, but also uh, in, uh, in the way they would like to uh, respond to consumer markets and to, the, to their target uh, groups. Yes, Bas, I, I asked both a large furniture company and a large packaging company if they recognize the economic challenges of, of the transition. Mm -hmm. and the lack of financial incentives in the short term. In other words, why would I disrupt my own empire when I'm making huge margins in a throwaway, single-use model mm -hmm. with, a, with global supply chains and cash flow structures based on volume sales or asset sales? Yeah. Of course, they didn't want to answer this and told me instead that sustainability is in the DNA of their organization, blah, 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 and all the CSR stuff. What are your thoughts around this? Yeah. There are many companies, uh, in particular big companies, that uh, want to be seen as, uh, as pioneering, as leading society, um, partly because of corporate social responsibility uh, arguments or branding uh, arguments. That's, of course, good. But I think uh, it would be difficult, uh, it would be unrealistic to expect uh, that um, if there is no business case, 
for drastically investing in the circular economy that all companies in the world uh, that uh, they would do they, they would start to do that so there once more you need to have uh, the support from governments taxes and and uh, subsidies also the small and medium sized enterprises cannot be expected, of course, to invest in, let's say, in, in secondary materials when they know that they can get raw materials uh, for half of the price. So what you're saying is that in terms of financing this transition or, or financing the shift, it needs to be facilitated by government and by subsidies and that they play a key role in facilitating this move. Absolutely, absolutely. And of course, there, I mean, the low hanging fruits, um, there where uh, the business case is very obvious, of course, uh, there is no support needed and businesses are already taking good action. Uh, but there where the, the fruits are uh, hanging a bit higher, uh, you need to uh, you need to influence those framework conditions uh, as, as governments, as, as global governments. And that's exactly what we wanted to cover in our interview with Vice President Katainen. I feel we're ready to jump in, back to the tattoo shop. We had to make a little bit of a crazy setup because the sound of the machine was quite loud, but I guess it worked. We were going to have Vice President Katainen over the phone for some 30 minutes. And since the tattoo artist could not come to the studio with, with all the equipment and stuff, well, the studio came to the tattoo artist with all the equipment and stuff. You remember me? No. <laughs> uh, I wanted to do this uh, circular. Yeah, 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 yeah. sure. No. Yeah. When it comes to the design that we're gonna apply to Camille's shoulder, we had this approach of making an abstract symbol containing three uh, circles that are not yet closed. And the three circles, uh, they symbolize industry, public sector, civil society. The thing with circles that they're not closed is that they symbolize that there's still work to be done. And then when we reach a full circular economy, then we can close the... Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in 20 years. All right, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. How much time? You, how much time do you need? Uh, not too much. It doesn't take like too within long. within an hour. Yeah, know. yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Just let me set up so, the station. Yeah, we set up everything. And, yeah, cool. And call you in. Probably gonna be hard to hear with all the noise from machines. A few moments later. Okay, let's go. Good morning, Cabinet Katainen. Hello, good morning. This is Camille Duran from the Green Exchange. Yes. I'm just going to put you through to Vice President Katainen now. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. Hoppla. Great DJ. Hello, Jurgi Katainen. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. How is the day in Brussels? So far, yes, it's um, quite nice. Actually, very summer, summer-like weather, quite warm and sunny. Yeah, not always, not always typical weather in in process. <laughs> Thank you very much for being with us. I think you were briefed by your team on the key points we wanted to address. So maybe yes. we we can jump right in. Yep, very good. All right. Vice President Katainen, thank you very much for making time for us. We know how busy you are. Uh, we're going to talk about financing the transition towards circular economy. But before we dive in, I wanted to get your feeling on how serious and committed the EU actually is about the circular economy transition. We are very committed because uh, according to our understanding, circular economy will be the next mega trend in the world market economy because it makes a lot of uh, business sense. It's, um, uh, it has big environmental and societal, societal benefits and um, it will help businesses to, to reduce risks and also uh, it will raise uh, productivity and competitiveness. So, that is the reason, or those are the reasons why Commission proposed a circular economy package okay. uh, just uh, a little bit more than a year ago. 
Well, that's very good to hear um, because we feel that many organizations are very serious about contributing to, to its implementation. Yes, yes. Today I wanted to use this interview to make something symbolic, something that will last and that we'll be able to look at in 2030 and hopefully in 2050 and feel very proud of looking at the transition we'll, we'll have been able to achieve altogether. Yes. Now, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about right now, um, but I'm actually in a tattoo shop and I have a tattoo artist ready to go besides me. Okay. And what I would like to do is to get a circular economy symbol tattooed on my shoulder while we run this interview. It sounds good. Very good. If that doesn't make you too uncomfortable. Oh, no, no, no. It, it sounds interesting. I thought about this. And I think that sometimes in life you have to show that you're serious and we're yep. all serious here. So You are very brave and committed. Yeah, let's go because I want to be careful with your time. And uh, I hope I hope it's not gonna be too noisy. Be best luck. Okay. I pause here for a second. Um, in the post production process we lowered the volume of my track while he replies over the phone because the sound of the machine is quite disturbing. All right, back to it. So at this point in the series, we have introduced everything and we really want to dive into the financial aspects. So in the financial industry, first of all, um, we are successful when we minimize risk and maximize return. And it's kind of the golden rule, right? In practice, how can we incentivize the financial industry to, to support companies that are successfully making the transition and avoid those that cannot or are in a shrinking sector? Well, uh, sometimes slow repayments and low rates of return might make it difficult in the beginning to market projects in the green economy. But uh, I firmly believe that the financial sector is willing and capable to adapt new business models. So, um, sometimes uh, it may be necessary for uh, for the public sector to step in with guarantees to cover first losses in order to reassure yeah. private investors. But we are confident that once the viability of these projects is demonstrated, these concerns will dissipate. EU has um, established a new financial instrument which name is European Fund for Strategic Investment. Its acronym is EFSI and it's part of the European Investment Bank and it's providing risk financing to private and public private partnership investments and this is an excellent tool for new technology investments and circular economy uh, businesses. But um, the main issue I think in this field uh, is to create regulatory clarity and certainty for private sector. For instance, as part of our circular economy package, we uh, propose that we have to increase uh, recycling of waste, and uh, there there will be exact time or exact year when this has to happen. It's legally binding target to member states. Also, we want to reduce significantly to municipality waste going to landfills. So once the regulation is in place, the entire world start adapting there and then finance sector most probably will follow the needs of the investors. Right, and this is a key issue often discussed with, with green finance, um, how to build enough confidence so the private sector can, can really step in with, with financing. Exactly. We'll, we'll talk more about this, but another question first. Um, we see flows of money changing in a circular economy. Um, for instance, the, the pay-for-use model has a very different cash flow structure than the traditional pay-for-ownership approach. And this directly impacts the, the cost structure of the company and, of course, its financing requirements. Yep. Do you recognize this challenge and how can we facilitate the shift? What are some of your thoughts around this? Yeah, I, I acknowledge that the transition towards the circular economy will also challenge uh, some established way, ways how business is done. 
our role is to help and support innovative approaches and encourage new business models. We, for instance, uh, announced uh, as part of the circular economy package uh, the action plan in which we are working on launching a platform to support the financing of the circular economy. This platform should bring together Commission, European Investment Bank, national banks and commercial banks interested to participate. And the aim would be to look into existing possibilities for financing circular economy projects, exchange best practices and point out gaps and eventually propose improvements and, and propose new instruments for financing circular projects. Last uh, uh, January, I participated to Davos, uh, annual Davos meeting, and it was quite fascinating to listen that there were already a big amount of banks, well-known, uh, established, well-established um, uh, commercial banks who were already designing new products for circular economy uh, needs. For instance, they said that leasing is growing business and uh, the leasing needs uh, different financial um, opportunities than just um, a linear business model. But it's not only about financing. Uh, in early June this year, uh, Commission presented guidance through a communication aimed at supporting consumers and businesses and public authorities to engage confidently in the collaborative economy. These, these new business models can make really an important contribution to jobs and growth in the, Europe, in the European Union uh, and encourage uh, and, and develop in a new responsible manner. The lack of uh, legal clarity and regulatory fragmentation sometimes hamper the development of uh, the collaborative economy in Europe. So um, with this communication, the Commission explains how to apply existing EU law to collaborative economy with the, the objective of promoting the balanced development of a collaborative economy in Europe. If the efficiency of the economy increases because materials are not thrown away, but enter new production processes, a positive effect on GDP is to be expected, right? Even if the estimation is, is rather difficult. Uh, do you like GDP as an indicator, by the way? Because, yeah. I think it tells what, what it tells. I mean, it's, it doesn't tell everything, but it tells the production and, and normal economic growth. So I think it's a useful tool, but we should not expect everything from GDP. I agree. Yes. One negative effect of on one negative effect on GDP is the effect of repair and reuse, yeah. and which has a positive societal value. But still, with repair and reuse, we need less products, so less volume of sales. Yeah. What do you tell a CFO, uh, a CEO, and their shareholders when they logically forecast such a scenario, less volume of sales? Well, um, we don't have uh, any exact estimate how many jobs and how much growth the circular economy or the broad range of actions proposed in our action plan will deliver. However, there are a couple of... Um, international studies which are quite in interesting. Uh, the first study indicates that resource efficiency is one of the main drivers of uh, companies' competitiveness. Since uh, EU manufacturing firms uh, spend on average 40% of their costs on raw materials compared to a share of 20% for labor costs. It is uh, estimated that a better use of resources could deliver savings of uh, 630 billion euros per year for European industry. Another study shows that business-led, uh, uh, that, that uh, some, some private sector estimates says that the potential to boost EU GDP is very significant if we had more circular business models up and running. They are talking about close to 4% higher GDP only because of resource efficiency. 
how can governments incentivize and support their commercial sector to activate the shift and, and deliver short-term results when the global landscape is so competitive and linear? Exactly. Maybe you have very good intentions as, as a company and you're keen on implementing the strategies we, we're describing in this series, but your competitor in Asia doesn't care. Yeah. You're playing on the global landscape, there's a war on prices. How do you compete? Well, I'm not very sure if world is still leaning towards a linear model. I just came back from China and uh, there we discussed about circular economy because circular economy is included in China's current five-year plan and they are taking it very, very seriously. And everybody understand why, because uh, there's an environmental necessity. And um, we agreed that we will uh, compare our uh, regulatory changes or our ideas how to boost uh, circular economy business models both in China but also in Europe because in Europe of course we have environmental necessity to be more sustainable but also we have a uh, economic necessity because our production should be uh, higher added value and our productivity should be higher in order to finance welfare model of our, our economy. So that's why um, circular economy uh, business models uh, are necessary in order to improve added value, which, uh, and, and by, by doing so we, we can get more uh, revenues for welfare society. So uh, the, the world market is already changing, and one reassuring or assuring um, fact is that if you look at the best practices or best examples in circular economy field, they come from private sector. So private companies are leading the, leading the, the development at the moment, and it should show to everybody that this is not circular economy is not just a public sector's aim or traditional environmental stuff. Instead, it's uh, already uh, up and running. And, and it has come from the business logic. And now we as a regulator and decision makers has to understand how we can foster the development. There, I, I just give you a couple of examples. The first one is that public procurement accounts roughly one-fifth of uh, EU's GDP. So mm. this could be a powerful tool to uh, to boost, activate uh, circular economy business models if decision makers in local level and in national level would use um, our guidance. The Commission has provided voluntary guidance for member states and for municipalities how to... Yeah, the call was disconnected. Let, let me just restart it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's all right. Hello, this is Camille Duran again. Yeah, we were disconnected. Ah, uh, okay. All right, let's continue. Yeah, sorry, we got disconnected. Yep. So this is very interesting, and it's going to be encouraging for the financial sector to digest this because those guys are not so much into saving the planet, as we know. Yep. They're more into making sure they're going to get actual returns on their investment. Yeah, that's right. So circular economy, in, in the term circular economy, the both word really matters. There should be circular and there should be economy. And basically, uh, for the policymakers, if we want to foster circular economy, we have to see or we have to make sure that profits are coming from somewhere. Otherwise, there's no profit, there's no economy. And, and that's why regulators has to be very cautious not to regulate wrong things but uh, but instead to create right incentives which will change the business logic and change the direction where the profits are coming from I'm curious to hear your um, your take on the tax system we have today and and the necessary shift from taxing labor to taxing natural resources any recent development on that front? Yeah, <clears throat> taxation is a very good tool, but in the European level, it's quite difficult to get common tax 
taxation because uh, in decision-making process we need unanimity and only one country can block all everything what the Commission is proposing. So that's why the Commission itself hasn't paid that much uh, attention to European-wide taxation, but we are also providing information to member states to look at the best practices from other countries. Okay, so this is not something you are directly involved with, but you provide some guidance and information to the national governments. Exactly. Vice President, thank you for your time. I know you need to run, and I'm really happy we could get into some level of detail together. Yes, I yes. still have half an hour of tattooing to go through before my, my circular economy symbol is ready. Okay, good luck. If this becomes a thing at the Commission, we could start an Instagram profile um, dedicated to circular economy tattoos. What do you think? That is very good. <laughs> All right, good luck and speak to you again soon. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Um, if one day you had told me that I would send a skin picture to the vice president of the EU Commission, I would have called you crazy. But you know what? We, we had to send the proof that this was all real. Now, we got very important insights from that discussion. Let's make good use of it. We hope you liked it, and we're going to follow up on those points as we unfold the rest of the series. In next episode, Barack Obama is getting his own circular economy tattoo, and I give him a call from an helicopter on fire. No, I'm kidding. The helicopter was not on fire. Remember, you can find us on Facebook at The Green Exchange Talk Show. Click like, and we keep you posted from there. Subscribe on iTunes or in your favorite podcast app. This way you can carry the Green Exchange in your pocket and listen from wherever you are. We'll be back soon for more green knowledge, inspiration and entertainment. Keep up the good work in the meantime. 